So in the past, I used to think that pre-built gaming PCs were for kids with rich parents and for people that maybe wanted to get into PC gaming but didn't quite have the technical knowledge or the confidence to build a system themselves. More recently, pre-built gaming PCs like this Zircon Goliath from PC Specialist have become much more relevant to the enthusiast market. During the great graphics card shortage of late 20 and 21, pre-built gaming PCs provided a way to get your hands on a high-end graphics card when you couldn't get them from more traditional stores. And then even more recently with hardware prices fluctuating and going up in price, pre-built gaming PCs have offered some really great value systems if you look hard enough. Today we take a look at the pinnacle of pre-built gaming PCs with this Zircon Goliath from PC Specialist packing an AMD Ryzen 9 7950X 3D CPU and an Nvidia RTX 4090 graphics card. So let's find out just how good this ultra high-end gaming PC really is. Wolf Pro. Tough, ready, scalable. So this Zircon Goliath system from PC Specialist is available to purchase from the PC Specialist online web store in this configuration that you see here for £3,499. That might sound expensive but I can assure you it is really good value if you were to buy all the components yourself and build this system yourself. I checked out PC Part Picker. The price individually for the parts is around 3,900 and that's not including the Windows installation. So it does sound expensive, but it offers really good value for money compared to building the system yourself. It is a very high spec system. As I said in the intro, this is the pinnacle of gaming PCs or gaming systems. Forget consoles or forget anything that's come before it. This is the best you can get for the money right now. The case is a Height Y60. There's been a lot of talk about these cases. I didn't review one when it came out. I don't even think Leo reviewed one of these. So this is really my first look at one of these cases. And I've got some interesting things to talk about, especially when it comes down to temperatures and thermals of the GPU and CPU, which we'll look at uh, shortly in the video. As I've already mentioned, the CPU in this is an AMD Ryzen 9 7950X 3D, so the latest AMD CPUs with 3D vCache. Leo reviewed that CPU recently. He absolutely loved it for a gaming CPU. The uh, 7800 X3D has released since, and probably is slightly better for gaming but it is a great CPU, especially for gaming the 7950X3D. Motherboard is an Asus Tough Gaming X670E plus Wi-Fi, so DDR5, PCI, E5, everything you need for gaming and more on the motherboard. Graphics is a Palette RTX 4090 Game Rock, so 24 gigabytes memory. It's not the RGB version, I forget the name of this one, but it's got that same kind of crystally diamond effect on the front but no RGB, which does seem like a bit of a, a bit of an odd choice since this case only does vertical mounting. You would have thought the RGB version would have been better in this case because you can see all the RGB lighting better in vertical mounting. I think even Dominic in his review of that card said it would be a great card for vertical mounting because of the RGB effects. But this is the non-RGB version. For storage, there's just a single device in the system. It's an M.2 NVMe PCIe Gen 4 Samsung 990 Pro 2 terabyte. So it should be enough to get you going, get your initial games and stuff installed. But you might want to add extra storage in the future, say in a year or so's time. Two terabytes is okay, but game installs are getting bigger and bigger all the time. So I'd say probably two terabyte for a gaming PC is the minimum now, especially a high-end system like this. The power supply in the system is a 1000 watt Corsair RMX power supply. So that's an 80 plus gold fully modular power supply. CPU cooler is a Corsair IQ H150i Elite LCD XT. So it's a 360 millimeter radiator, three 120 millimeter fans. It has some RGB lighting effects on the fans and a LCD screen on the actual CPU block, which can be configured with the Corsair 
iQ software. Also the memory is from Corsair, so it's a 32 gigabyte kit, Corsair Dominator Platinum RGB DDR5, 6,000 mega transfers per second. The RGB lighting effects on the memory and the CPU cooler, as I said, can be controlled, changed by the uh, Corsair iQ software and also fan speed and pump speed of the cooler that is also configured in the Corsair iQ software, which is the only real bit of software that comes pre-installed on the system. Obviously it comes with Windows. I say obviously, there are actually some pre-built systems that don't come with Windows pre-installed, which is something you have to factor in as well when you're looking at the price of pre-built systems. I uh, saw one from eBuyer, I can't remember the name of their pre-built systems, AlphaSync I think they're called, that didn't come with Windows, so that may have been cheaper than some alternatives, but you would just have to remember you with something like that, you do have to pay the extra for Windows. But on the PC specialist system, Windows 11 is pre-installed, Corsair IQ comes pre-installed, and the only other bit of software to note that came pre-installed on this was Norton Antivirus for Gamers, and honestly, that was so annoying with pop-ups and things coming up all the time, I just had to uninstall that pretty much straight away because it was just getting on my nerves all the time popping up with things. So that's the spec of the system. As I've said, it is as good as you can get at the moment for gaming with this CPU and GPU configuration. So there isn't really anything out there in terms of performance that should beat this. In terms of how it's been put together from PC specialists, normally PC specialists do an absolutely brilliant job of the assembly and the choice of hardware matching the theme of the you know the color of hardware and making sure everything looks right in this system the hardware matching is good i like the selection of components maybe one or two things with the cooling need to be changed or maybe are not optimal but there have been a couple of maybe qc issues with this system that i've never seen before on a pc specialist system which is a bit of a shame so when I first got the system, plugged everything in, tried to power it on, it just went through boot cycles, no post on the screen, no display, and it actually halted on the VGA error. Quick look inside the system, it was easy to see why it did that. The PCIe riser cable had either not been plugged in correctly in assembly, or had become loose during shipping. I plugged that PCIe cable back in correctly, and the PC fired up first time. I think possibly, it was more down to the assembly, why it didn't work. I don't think it had been pushed into the socket fully when the system was assembled because I had a good tug at that afterwards and it was impossible to pull it out of the slot once it had been pushed in and clipped into place correctly. So I think that may be down to an assembly problem. I've spoke to PC specialists about that and they're gonna have a look at why this might have happened, make sure it doesn't happen again in the future. So that's just one thing to mention to begin with about the build. Other than that, everything looks like it's been installed correctly, apart from that PCIe riser cable. Cable management's all right. It's a little bit messy around the front where the 24 pin cable goes through and things like that. That could have been a little bit tidier on a system this high spec and this expensive. I might have liked to have seen some better power supply cables or at least a power supply with some cables that have cable combs and looked a bit neater and things like that. I also would have liked to have seen a couple of intake fans down this side of the system here, because the only intake in the system at the moment is coming from the pre-installed height fan. So there's two on the floor blowing in, and then the one at the rear is an exhaust. The CPU cooler fans, they're also exhaust as well. So I think a couple of side fans here as intakes would have improved not only the looks of the system with some RGB fans, but maybe it might have helped with thermals, which I'm gonna get onto soon. But overall, it's not a bad looking system. The Hyatt Y60, I'm still in two minds about whether I like that yet. It does, for some reason, makes me think of a fish tank or aquarium from the 90s, but I am I am starting to come around with how it looks. But I do think it has some restrictions with airflow and temperatures, as again, I said, we will look at that soon. But it's not a bad looking system. The hardware that's been matched together, it all looks neat and tidy, and it all has got a quite nice, understated, dark and moody black theme with just that bit of RGB lighting at the top, which I do quite like. So moving on to the performance and benchmarks. So first I want to look at the gaming performance. So I've run six benchmarks from relatively modern titles. The first is 
is Anno 1800 with the IQ preset at ultra high, eight times AA. You can see 1440p resolution, produced an average of 307 FPS with the 1% lows at 162. Bumping the resolution up to 2160p 4K, lowered the average FPS to 151 with the 1% lows at 85, which is still very good 4K performance. In Cyberpunk 2077 with the IQ preset at Ray Tracing Ultra, 1440p average frame rates were 137 with the 1% lows at 104. And again, bumping up the resolution to 2160p and 4K, reduced average FPS to 103 with the 1% lows at 81. In the F1 2022 benchmark we set the track to Singapore in the wet which is the most difficult out of all the benchmarks on this game. The IQ preset was at ultra high with ray tracing on and motion blur off. Again 1440p frame rates were higher at the average of 157 with the 1% lows dropping to 95. 2160p resolution did affect performance dropping the average average frame rate to 82 fps and 1% lows at 59 fps. The Godfall benchmark is an easier benchmark to run. IQ preset was set to epic, motion blur off and ray tracing on. 1440p frame rates were very high at 225 in this game with the 1% lows dropping to 166. And in 4K resolution, average fps was 121 and 1% lows at 79. Horizon Zero Dawn, the IQ preset was ultimate quality with motion blur off again we saw very high 1440p frame rates with an average of 229 1% lows were at 161 in this game at 1440p knocking the resolution up to 2160p 4k reduced fps to 155 average with 1% lows at 114 and finally Watch Dogs Legion with the IQ preset at ultra TAA and RTX on average 1440p resolution was 130 fps 1% lows dropped to 90 then at 2160p 4K, average FPS was just over 100 with 1% lows at 86. So gaming performance in this system is absolutely spot on, which we would expect with a system in such high configuration with this CPU and GPU. 4K gaming seems to be a breeze in most games and even turning on ray tracing, you're still getting really high frame rates, which is excellent. And then looking at benchmarks that measure other aspects of system performance, such as content creation, multitasking, etc. We can see in the Cinebench R23 benchmark, the CPU in the Zircon Goliath scored a multi-thread score of 35,270 and a single thread score of 1,968, which is comparable to what Leo found in his review of the 7950X3D at launch. So the CPU seems to be running as it should be. The Ada 64 memory benchmark. So the performance of the memory during this benchmark was slightly slightly down on what we would have expected and as you can see in the chart it's slightly down on a system that I reviewed previously that was running at slower memory speed. Maybe this is due to the BIOS, maybe when these uh, X3D BIOS becomes more mature we might see that improve but the performance was slightly down compared to the CyberPower Infinity X135 Plus that was only running at DDR5 5600 mega transfers per second but that was also on an Intel platform so whether that made the difference. And then in the PC Mark 10 benchmark so this measures the overall performance of a system in things like digital content creation, productivity, general web browsing and such like we can see performance in the PC Mark 10 benchmark was excellent. Again, it's not a surprise knowing the performance of this CPU, but things like digital content creation, productivity, general web browsing were the best we've seen out of all systems we've reviewed in the past. Then on to power usage measured at the wall. So the Zircon Goliath during a complete stress test was pulling 731 watts from the wall and during a 4K gaming load that reduced to 599 watts. So it is quite greedy on power, but again, we know this from the launch reviews of the 4090 that's going to be using a lot of power under load but still it's way below the maximum rating of the 
6,000 watt power supply in the system. So that seems all good. Then the thermal performance, I wanted to leave till last because I'm just going to quick show you a quick demonstration of what's going on with the thermal performance of this system. I don't think it's quite optimal with the, especially the graphics card in this case, but also the CPU temperature seems a little high in this system compared to what we saw in Leo's review of the 7950X3D. We run a combined thermal test to fully stress test the system. So that consists of running the 3D Mark stress test in a loop for 30 minutes and simultaneously running the Cinebench R23 stress test again in a loop simultaneously to fully load the system and get everything up to temperature. You can see during that stress test with the case in its default configuration, so all the side panels on as it would come from PC specialist, average CPU temperature in that test was 91 degrees C with an ambient of about 22 degrees C. That sounds a little high, especially when you compare to Leo's review of the 7950X3D, he was getting 75 to 80 degrees C with almost an identical CPU cooler. The GPU temperature again seems high with the case in its default configuration with an average at 77 degrees C. If you look back at Dominic's review of the uh, Palette RTX 4090 Game Rock, he was getting a significantly lower GPU temperature than we've got in the Zircon Goliath. I then ran all that stress test again, the simultaneous stress test, removed the tempered glass side panel, and you can see CPU temperature dropped slightly by about five, six degrees C to an average of 86, which is still high compared to what Leo saw in his review, and the GPU significantly reduced in temperature to 66 degrees average, which is more in line with what Dominic found during his review of this graphics card. So I'm not sure that the case is ideally suited to this configuration because the graphics card is a three and a bit slot card, which means it is extremely close to the tempered glass side panels, probably 10, 15 millimeters of clearance between the fans and the tempered glass, which isn't ideal. Also, the fan configuration, I think could be improved. PC specialists could install a couple of intake fans down this side panel. They didn't choose to do that. They've opted for just the standard height fans. So there's 220 mil height fans in the floor, drawing in some cool air, which, you would have thought might help the graphics card, but it doesn't seem to do that much. And then just a single 120 mil stock height fan in the back of the case as an exhaust. Obviously there's the three 120 mil fans on the CPU cooler also working as exhaust. So to show you the effect of removing the side panel while the system is under load and what effect that has on the thermal performance. I've got that combined stress test running again. Cinebench R23 is running, as well as the 3D Mark Speedway benchmark running continuously in a loop. So you can see from this, the CPU temperature is currently averaging about 90 degrees. It is slightly lower than when I did this test originally because the ambient in here has dropped by a couple of degrees, but CPU temperature is roughly at 90 degrees average. Again, in Leo's review, that was more like 75, 80 degrees C. So that seems a bit high with the tempered glass panel installed. And the graphics card currently is at 77 degrees on the GPU core. And again, Dominic saw lower temperatures of his review of the Palette Game Rock. So that's what we're getting currently with the tempered glass side panel installed. If I just remove that, one other thing as well, you can hear maybe if I put the mic closer, the system is really loud when it's under load. Because of those high temperatures, the default fan curves are ramping the fan RPM up and the system is quite loud, it's quite distracting. Maybe you could tweak those a bit better through the IQ software and uh, the fan configuration software for the graphics card, but in its default configuration, the system is quite loud when components start to heat up, which could be a bit distracting. If you've got your headphones on playing games, maybe not so much. So if I just remove the side panel, you should be able to see on screen how that affects the temperature because the graphics card temperature does drop pretty quickly. So side panels removed. You can see already the graphics card temperatures drop from around 77 degrees 
to below 70 now already down to 67 66 degrees almost instantly after just removing that side panel which also means that the frequency of the gpu core will start increasing and then potentially you're going to see an improvement in performance of the graphics card and you see we've literally had the side panel off for less than a minute and the gpu temperature is now down at 61 degrees so it's dropped by 15 degrees that is a considerable drop in temperature so that that is the problem with this case almost forcing you to have the graphics card uh, installed vertically on a big thick card like this 4090 it pushes it really close to the tempered glass side panel and it just stifles the airflow to the fans and now you can see temperatures leveled off now at about 61 degrees on that graphics card which is much better than it was in the default case configuration CPU temperature hasn't dropped much. I noticed this in my first round of tests. Removing the side panel basically makes this case an open frame. You would think that on an open test bench, airflow is good to the CPU cooler at the top and you might see the CPU temperature dropping, but it doesn't really do much, maybe a degree or two. I have run some uh, alternative configurations. So I added a couple of these Fantex D30 120 mil fans to the side here to see if improved intake airflow would improve the CPU temperature. Didn't seem to do anything. As you can see, removing the tempered glass hasn't really improved it. The only way I could get the CPU temperature down to something more like what Leo saw in his review of this CPU was to change the cooler for an EK Nucleus AIO 360. With the EK Nucleus on there, CPU temperature dropped by almost 10 degrees C, which is a considerable amount. So maybe this Corsair cooler isn't as good as the EK, or maybe it has some manufacturing defect that is making it not work as effectively as it should. I did try applying new thermal paste, reseating the CPU block, everything like that with this cooler and there was no improvement. So that's something maybe for PC specialists to look at. In this high-end system, I'd like to see temperatures improved, especially the GPU and the CPU temperature for me is higher than it needs to be with this CPU. Don't forget this is only 150 watts this cpu is pulling under load it's not like something like a 13900k or 3900ks pulling over 300 watts a 360 mil cooler should keep this cpu cooler than it is doing in this system so because of those temperature issues with the cpu and gpu and because of the system not being able to boot when it first arrived having to plug in the pcie riser cable i'm only going to score this system seven out of ten which might sound a bit harsh because the performance is good, but I think PC specialists probably need to just take another look at the configuration, maybe putting it in a different case or changing CPU coolers or graphics cards to perform more like what we would expect in terms of thermals because whilst ever the thermals are higher, the performance is going to be slightly reduced. But there are some good points to this system. It does seem to be really good value for money if you are considering building the exact same spec separately. You're gonna save yourself a few hundred pounds, which is always good. It is great for 4K gaming and the hardware inside the case all seems to look nice and paired well with each other. So there are some good points, but those issues just spoil the system a little bit for me. And it probably wouldn't be one that I'd recommend to buy in this configuration, in this case, if PC specialists change it or if you change the configuration of the system yourself, put it in a case that's more suitable to these components, then it would be worth buying. But as it is, it's not one that I can recommend. So I hope you've enjoyed this review of the PC Specialist Zircon Goliath. As I say, you can buy this system now from PC Specialist at just under £3,500. Let me know what you think of the system in the comments section. Let me know what you think of the issues and thermals and things like that. If you've enjoyed watching this video, don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. If you enjoy what we do here at KitGuru and you want to help support us, you can always head over to the store and pick up some of the merch. Or you can even subscribe to our Patreon. And as always, if you want to catch up on all the in-depth technical reviews, head over to the website.